Well, as we come together this morning, it's Easter and it's a special time for us to come together. But as a church, we've been taking a journey over the last few months. We call it our year with Jesus. And uh, we are spending time this, um, this year looking at the four Gospels and trying to better acquaint ourselves with who Jesus is. This morning we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's one of the, uh, the best known sermons in the Bible. It's a powerful passage of Scripture and I think it speaks a lot to where we're at today. And so we'll come back to that in a minute. Our year with Jesus is a time for us to slow down. As a society, we live so busy, always rushing and rushing and running and running. And so our year with Jesus is a time for us to slow down and to pay attention to who Jesus is. And sometimes we need to hear stories we may have heard before as if we're hearing them for the first time. So we finished the Gospel of Mark in the first quarter of this year. Now we're in the book of Matthew. And Matthew is an eyewitness to the story of Jesus. And I think that plays heavily into the, the sermon that we're going to read this morning. So when, the, when Jesus was on this earth, when he was walking around, Matthew was one who was actually walking with Jesus. He was seeing what Jesus was, was doing. He was listening as Jesus was teaching. And so he writes this story down. He took Mark's Gospel. Mark wrote a very brief Gospel. And Matthew just put some meat on the bones, so to say. He fleshed out the Gospel, specifically in this area of teaching. He, he remembered and wrote down all that Jesus, not all, but most of what Jesus taught. Now Matthew was a very analytical person. How many of you here today would consider yourself to be analytical? Meaning you like to have all the details taken care of. You, you think ahead. You plan ahead. And mornings like this drive you crazy because you're trying to get kids out the door looking perfect. Matthew was one of these analytical people. Matthew was someone who, who wanted things to go in a certain way and he thought through, he reasoned through. And when somebody taught something, that meant a lot to Matthew. He remembered that. We see in Matthew's Gospel a distinct attention to detail. He really was paying attention to all the details of what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing. Now the Sermon on the Mount is not a typical Easter sermon. I've never preached. This is my 12th Easter as a pastor. I've never preached on the Sermon on the Mount before at Easter. But it's where we're at in our reading as we spend this year with Jesus. And I figured that a sermon preached by Jesus is better than anything I could come up with on my own anyway. So hopefully this morning this is helpful for you because it's not just me, it's coming from Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is the first of five sections that Matthew devoted to Jesus' teachings. And it's a sermon that is really uncomfortable. And that follows with Matthew's start to his Gospel because it seems like everything Matthew says or everything Matthew records up to this point in his gospel has been enough to make people uncomfortable. Now it's interesting who it would make uncomfortable. It's not the everyday people that it would make uncomfortable. But it was the leaders of the church that it would make uncomfortable. And Matthew wrote his story and he included in the genealogy of Jesus the prostitutes. The people who had very questionable relationships and Matthew included those stories in Jesus' genealogy. Matthew emphasized in his telling of the, the story of the birth of Jesus that Matthew was not the, or that Joseph was not Jesus' father, and, and in that culture, in that day, that was a sin punishable by death. Matthew continued to tell us uncomfortable story after uncomfortable story, and this sermon that he, that he records Jesus preaching is just as uncomfortable as everything else that we've already read. It's a sermon that would have made a lot of people mad. Now, I've preached a lot of sermons in the last 12 years. I've never had anybody, maybe one person, not at this church, the other one, get up in the middle of a sermon mad and storm out. It just hasn't happened. I mean, maybe it will today. Who knows? Today may be the lucky day. But this is one of those sermons that Jesus was preaching 
that would have had people standing up and marching out in a huff. Because he says some things in this sermon that really would have rubbed the church people wrong. A sermon that would have made a lot of people mad. Jesus preached something very different from the message messages that people were used to hearing. He preached in this sermon about a blessedness that did not depend on wealth or power. When we think in our culture about what it means to be blessed, if somebody's blessed, typically it has either to do with their health, their wealth, or their power. Those are the things that we think about when it comes to being blessed in our culture today. And Jesus taught a type of blessedness that didn't depend on any of those things. Jesus preached to the heart, not just outward behavior. And most of the people in those days were preaching to get people to look like they had it all together on the outside, but didn't care about what was taking place on the inside. And Jesus preached different. You see, Jesus was preaching for life transformation. He wanted people's lives to be different as a result of what He was preaching. He didn't just come so that people could feel good and then go on with life. He wanted to do something inside of them that was different. Something that brought peace. Something that brought hope. Something that took away all of the emptiness and the anger. Jesus preached things. Or preached that things won't make you happy. I'm not a salesman anymore. I used to be. My job used to be telling people that a roof is going to fix all their problems because I sold roofs. I used to sing that song, All Hail King Jesus. Because for roofers, hailstorms were wonderful. I added a line, All Hail King Jesus, All Hail for Emmanuel. <laughs> we live in a world that's all about making us think if we can just buy one more thing, we're going to be happy. If I say that, most of you know what that one thing that's next on the list is, don't you? What's that one thing that's, that's going to make you happy? What's that one thing that you're saving towards or that you're, you're trying to figure out how you're going to purchase that one thing? Most of us have that one thing. And many of us have those, many of those things that we've bought in the past and we look back on them and they really didn't make us happy, so now we're on to the next thing. We live in a culture that's all about what's next to make us happy. And Jesus preached in this sermon that things aren't going to make you happy. You can keep chasing after this stuff and you can accumulate a bunch of it and you're no better off than the birds of the air. That doesn't sit well in our culture. It certainly didn't sit well in Jesus' culture. This one probably made people more angry than anything else. When Jesus said that you should look at yourself before you start judging others. That doesn't sit well with our culture. It's much easier for us to point fingers at other people than it is for us to look at ourselves. And Jesus said in this sermon that we're not supposed to be looking at everybody else. We're supposed to be looking at us. There was a large crowd gathered the day that Jesus preached this sermon. And Matthew was an eyewitness. He was likely in that crowd and it seems like Matthew got the message. Now, Matthew wrote this Gospel, and he was one of the twelve disciples, but he was called later in Jesus' ministry. He was not among the first disciples called. We talked last week about in our sermon about uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were the first four disciples called to follow Jesus. The first four men that Jesus chose to, to come and learn from Him. Matthew was called to follow Jesus, but he wasn't called first. In fact, chances are, Peter and Andrew and James and John were in the, in, among Jesus' disciples the day that Jesus preached the sermon. And Matthew was probably a part of the crowd. And quite honestly, he was probably towards the back of the crowd. Trying to figure out what was, was it that about this man, what was everybody gathered together to hear this guy say? 
Now, Matthew also went by the name Levi. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, Luke doesn't talk about Matthew. It talks about Levi. Levi's a good Jewish name. It's one of the original 12 tribes. But Matthew wasn't a very good Jew. And he didn't go by his Jewish name. Because he was a tax collector. Anybody in this room a tax collector? Just making sure. This, this sermon hit home for me. I got my tax bill this week. Oh, man. I don't love tax collectors at this moment. But it was my fault. I just didn't pay enough ahead. I thought I did. I didn't. Tax collectors in our day, really there's one time a year that we really struggle with them. This time of year leading up to that April 15th date. The time of year that we really... Oh, really resent those people. In Matthew's day, in Jesus' day, they hated the tax collectors all year long. They did taxes a little bit different there than they do taxes here. Here we have a set tax code, and it's, if anybody is really, really smart and has no life outside of it, you can understand this tax code. You can understand what it means and, and who has to pay what and how much and where. In that day, they did things very different. In that day, tax collectors were selected because they were wealthy people. And they would go to the Roman government and they would say, we will pay the taxes for this county. And they would pay a set amount up front to cover the, te- the taxes for this area. And then they would go to the people and collect mo- as much money as they wanted to get their money back. And plenty of profit on the side. So to put that in perspective, if I were to, to be a tax collector in that day, I would go and I would say, hmm, we've got about 150 people in here today, so I'm going to pay $100,000 for the taxes for everybody that's in this room. And then I'm going to come to you and I'm going to tell each one of you, you have to pay me $2,000 taxes. <laughs> now you can see that I'm making a killing when I do that. But you know what? A tax collector could do it. And they did it. Sometimes they would charge four times as much as they were required to, to charge. Tax collectors were hated in their culture. In fact, they were not only hated, they had their own category of sinners because they had sold out to the Romans. They ripped off their fellow countrymen. And if you look throughout the Gospels, there will be this phrase, sinners and tax collectors. So there's sinners, there's horrible people, and then there's the people that are more horrible than that. There's the sinners and the tax collectors. Now it's interesting that Jesus would call the tax collector to come and be his disciple. It's interesting that the tax collector would want to leave his profitable business and come and follow Jesus. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. What would cause Matthew, as a pretty wealthy tax collector, uh, someone who has the chance to make two to four times as much money as he invests every year, what would cause him to leave that profitable business and follow after someone who didn't even have a home? Someone who was just walking here and there teaching about something different. You see, Matthew was looking for something real. Matthew grew up in the Jewish culture, and if you grow up in the Jewish culture with a name like Levi, you're going to hear all the stories, you're going to experience all the the stuff of what church is supposed to be. But he'd had enough of the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He'd seen enough. And he said, I don't want any part of that. If they're going to be like that, I don't want to be a part of it. As I said earlier, Matthew was analytical. He was calculated. He was thinking through these things. And he thought through this question, do I want to be like those people? Or do I want to be somebody who's making the money? And he made the decision to not be like somebody over here who was leading in the church, leading in the the synagogues. He said, I'd rather make money 
than live like that. And he had watched a lot of teachers come and go. Their messages were all the same. Just behave better. Just behave better and give money here. Behave better and give money there. There were a lot of revolutionaries. People who came before Jesus that that really tried to stir things up and, and change things. Many of them would claim to be the Messiah. And they would get a crowd to follow them. But they would have one big deal and then they would kind of go their way. Kind of like a one-hit wonder. You guys ever heard of one-hit wonders? Yeah, yeah I have two things. Did, did you know that if you search Apple Music, there are playlists set up for one-hit wonders from almost every decade? Did you know that there are albums just dedicated to one-hit wonders? How many of you think you're good at one-hit wonders? Chase, are you good at one-hit wonders? All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. If you've been around the church this week, I felt like I have to explain this. Um, Raymond was here yesterday. Carrie was here yesterday. And I was listening to all of this music. It's not the type of music I normally listen to. But I was putting together a little video that I want us to watch to see if we can recognize some of these one-hit wonders. Now, some of them go back to the 50s. Because I know there's some people in here that go back to the 50s. See, Steve, you were what? You were, you were only about 30 then, right? And then there's some from more of the time when I was growing up. And I don't know what the one-hit wonders are now. I didn't go past 2000, I don't think. But let's listen to a couple of these. The way it's going to work is there'll be a slide that says one-hit wonder. The song will start. If you know it, go ahead and holler it out. And then the name of the song will show up. And then let me know if you know the, the artist. Go ahead and guess the artist. Some of these you may know. I knew two or three of them beforehand. So let's, let's try this. Kenny, we got the computer unmuted? Mm -hmm. All right. And who's it by? The monotones. Ronald and Ruby, did anybody know that one? Bobby Day, Rock and Robin. Who's saying the boy the boys are back in town? No, nope, not clean. Then Lizzie. You knew that one? I didn't know that one. What is love? Who sang this one? Had a day or had a way? Yeah. Turn it up a little bit, Kenny. Crisscross, jump. All right, you'll want to turn it back down after this one. Billy Ray Cyrus. I knew this one. And he was actually a two hit wonder.
turned up a little bit. <laughs> Who sang the Macarena? Las Del Rio. I had to do this slide twice. I misspelled it because I was so familiar with it. Brandon knew this one. Okay, so I could not sing along, but I was singing along with these all weekend because many of them were songs that I heard on the radio when I was growing up and you'd go into stores and you'd hear these songs. And I had no clue who these people were. Um, again, that lollipop, Ronald and Ruby. You remember Ronald and Ruby? Did you have the album? Did they have any other songs? <laughs> Records don't go back that far. <laughs> You see, we in our culture, we understand this concept of one-hit wonders. And I, I kind of enjoyed listening to these this, this week. As, as I was driving around, I just kept, I'd pull up those Apple Music playlists and listen through. It's like, some of them I knew, some of them I'd see the title, it's like, no way. And then I'd hear the chorus, oh yeah, I, I knew that one. A lot of the songs that I knew were a whole lot more inappropriate and not ready for Sunday mornings than I thought they were. Um... But we're used to those one-hit wonders. And in Jesus' day, there were a lot of one-hit wonders. People who would come along and preach a message, and they would get everybody excited, and then they would just fade off into the background. And Matthew had probably followed a couple of these because he wanted something different from what he was seeing in the Jewish leaders in his day. Matthew really wanted to understand that you could be blessed, that you could have joy regardless of your circumstances. Because Matthew was a wealthy man, but he had no friends because of his wealth. And he wanted to know, is it possible to have joy even if things don't go ideal? Matthew wanted to know if there was a purpose beyond himself or if life was just about making as much money as he could make. Matthew wanted to know if there was a genuine religion that cared for people, not just caring about putting on a show. Matthew wanted to know, is there a way to connect with God that isn't based on impressing others? Matthew wanted to know if there was freedom from chasing after money. Is there freedom from worrying about having enough? Freedom from the critical eyes of others. That's a pretty decent list of things that Matthew was looking for, isn't it? You see, I think it's very similar to the list that we have. What are we looking for? Now, I don't know everybody in this room today. Those of you that I do know, I don't know a single person in here whose life is perfect I don't know a single person in here who's everything just goes perfectly for you. We all have stuff in our life. And so the question is, for all of us in this room today, can we experience blessedness? Can we experience joy even though things in our life aren't what they should be? Can we experience peace even though things are crazy? Is there a purpose beyond ourselves? Is there a genuine religion that cares for people and not just putting on a show? Can we connect with God in such a way that it's not focused on impressing others? Can we find a freedom from chasing after money, from worrying about having enough, and freedom from the critical eyes of others? That's a pretty good list. I'll be quite honest with you. I feel like too often in our culture, the words that are used to describe the Pharisees in Jesus' day 
are the words that are used to describe the church today. That we come across as the hypocrites. That we come across as those who are making it difficult. But that's not the message that Jesus came to proclaim. What I want us to see today is that Matthew found what he was looking for. And he wrote it down. Now, the sermon, we're going to read parts of this sermon. These are the highlights of the sermon, not the whole thing. Just so you know, I last night read this sermon out loud to myself with my phone timing me. If I were to read the whole sermon from start to, to finish, it would be 12 and a half minutes. That's taking a pause for yawns and to take a drink because my throat was dry. So this is not the whole sermon. This is just highlights of it. But these are the parts that connected with Matthew. That is Matthew, this, this tax collector in the back of the crowd that day, looking up at Jesus as Jesus was teaching, wondering, is Jesus just another one-hit wonder? Or is He the real thing? And these are the things that caused Matthew to say, Jesus is the real thing. If you have your Bibles and you want to open up with me, or if you want to open up the church app, we're going to read from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. Now I want to pause for a moment because English doesn't do this justice. We translate this, God blesses those. The actual Aramaic word that Jesus used is a word called blessedness. Really it's, oh the blessedness of. They had another frequent use of this word in that day. They used it to describe the island of Cyprus. Has anybody ever been to Cyprus? You've been to Cyprus? Cyprus is now on my bucket list. I've learned a lot about Cyprus this week. It's got some political tension right now. It's, it's a huge island in the Mediterranean with borders towards Turkey and uh, Europe, towards um, Asia, and towards Africa. So it's bordered by three continents. But they say it's the perfect island because the, the climate, they have 340 days of sunshine a year. They have amazing beaches. They have beautiful mountains. They have fertile plains. And so in that day, in Jesus' day, they called Cyprus the, Mount, or the, the island of blessedness. So when Jesus hearers would hear this, this phrase as Jesus was speaking, they were hearing, oh, it would be like paradise. Oh, it would be like being on Cyprus. Oh, the blessedness for those who are poor and realize their need for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, that's different from what all the other preachers said. It's not blessed to be poor, unless you're only poor because you've given to the preacher. And Jesus said, it's blessed to be poor. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you on Facebook because you are my followers. Oh, that wasn't in there, but... Be happy about it. Be very glad. And remember, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way, though not on Facebook. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. 
You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Father. And when Jesus is talking about what we call the Beatitudes, those statements of blessing, what Jesus is saying to the crowd that day is you can experience the blessedness that goes beyond all of your expectations and it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter if you don't have any friends because you just collected taxes and they all hate you. It doesn't matter if everything is going wrong. It doesn't matter what goes on in the world around you. You can still experience joy. The blessedness of being in relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a peace that comes that Jesus was talking about that's different than anything that the religious leaders of His day was talking about. And then, Jesus continues to talk about the salt. That we are called to be the salt of the earth. A city on a hill, a light for the, for the nations, a light for others to see. There's that question of purpose that Matthew was looking for. Yes, I can experience joy regardless of what's happening around me. And yes, there is a purpose. I'm here to influence the lives of others. Let's keep reading. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will re lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you give to someone, when you see a need, don't put it on Facebook. Don't publish it out there for everybody to see. Just meet the need. Can you imagine how disruptive it would be if all of our church services were all just blowing trumpets and somebody coming up, coming up and bragging about what they did for somebody the other day? And yet that's what the Jewish worship was like. The, the, Matthew was so sick of people helping someone only so that they could get credit for it. Doing something for someone only so that they could get credit for it. Because it's a show. And Matthew said, I've seen enough shows. This is not what I'm looking for. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Don't put on your, your prayer shows. Prayer is about communicating with God. It's not about telling everybody how righteous you are. And then probably the part of this sermon that hit Matthew the deepest. The part of the sermon that talks about possessions. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat and rust destroys them. Where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When the eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. For no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothes? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for their heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow, or the lilies up here. 
They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat and what will we drink and what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And this part that probably spoke deeply to Matthew as well because he had experienced the judgment and criticism of others beyond what we can even fathom. Do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, help me get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with a speck in your friend's eye. Can you understand why people would get up and leave as Jesus preached this sermon? I didn't count how many times he used the phrase hypocrite throughout this sermon, but it was quite a bit. You know why he used that phrase? You know why that stuck with Matthew? Because there was an awful lot of hypocrites in that world. And you know what? There's an awful lot of hypocrites in ours as well. And I'm probably a pretty big hypocrite sometimes myself, even though I try really hard not to be. But Matthew was looking for something deeper than just a faith that made you look good in public, but did nothing to address the anger and the brokenness inside. And Matthew found what he was looking for in Jesus. Now our year with Jesus, as you remember, is a time to slow down and pay attention to who Jesus really is. To what the Bible says He really said. And it's a time to hear the whole story, not just the end. I think in churches we tend to to really focus on just a few key points of Jesus' life. We like to focus on on the resurrection and we celebrate this big every year we like to celebrate his birth we celebrate that every year but Jesus was more than just his birth and his death and resurrection there's a whole lot that Jesus came to accomplish that we read about in between that should speak to us just as much and it gives meaning to the birth and the resurrection so it's a time to hear the whole story not just the end and I would encourage you to join us with that, in that year with Jesus. There's a number of ways you can read along with us. It's in our church app. It's in the app store. Uh, if you want to receive an email every morning, just let me know and I'll send you an email at 1 o'clock every morning with the daily scriptures or it's in the bulletin each week. It's on our website. But let's get to know who Jesus really is and what he really said. Whoa, that was crazy. Is that what he said? He went really quick. Yeah. Matthew was a self-centered tax collector who willingly gave his resources and his life for others once he found what he had been looking for. Jesus was not a one-hit wonder. His message has been changing hearts for over 2,000 years. And so the question that I want us to wrestle with this morning is can we find what we're looking for in Jesus? Now I'll be honest with you, you're not going to find what you're looking for in Jesus if all you're looking for is just a feel good for a moment and then go on with your life. You're going to find what you're looking for in Jesus if you're willing to engage in a relationship with Him. I liken it to the relationship of marriage. When I first started dating Janelle, it's been... 20 some years ago we started dating and when I kind of figured out that I liked her and wasn't sure if she really liked me but as I started dating her I, I wanted to spend more and more time with her and 
And then I eventually ask her a question, will you, will you marry me? Put the ring on the wrong finger and everything. <laughs> wrong hand, actually, is what I did. I went for the wrong hand. I, when I asked her to marry me, there, there were expectations of what that married relationship would be like. I didn't say, hey, Janelle, would, would you marry me? And, and here's the deal. I'll, I'll think about you like once a week for about an hour. Like Sundays, I'll think about you for about an hour. And, and as long as nothing else is going on, I'll, I'll come and spend time with you for an hour. And, and you know, definitely on special occasions like Easter weekend, I'll, I'll be here like three times. I'll even come for breakfast. If I would have said that this is what marriage is, Janelle would have looked at me and said, you're nuts. Well, she probably said that anyway, appropriately so. But, but that's not a relationship. And I think too often in our culture, we've associated just coming to church every once in a while with, well, I know Jesus. But just as I couldn't have a marriage with my wife if I'm not consistently talking with her and, and, and getting to know her, we can't get to know Jesus unless we're consistently engaging who He is. And I think one of the greatest challenges that we have in our culture today is all of the ideas about Jesus rather than just getting to know who He actually was. Honestly, it's easier to just think about the ideas of Jesus because what I read from Matthew's Gospel this morning is rather convicting. It doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy inside, but that's not what Jesus came to do. He came to change our hearts, not to make us feel warm and fuzzy. And so I would encourage us to think about, are we looking for the same things that Matthew was looking for? Because it can be found. But it's only found if we make a commitment to a relationship. It's not a quick fix gimmick. There's no, you walk out of here today with a, with a coupon that you stick in your back pocket and you're good to go for the rest of your life and all eternity. That's not how this works. It's a relationship. It's a relationship that has power. As our worship team comes, as we prepare to close, the power of Jesus Christ spoke to Matthew as he was in the background of the sermon that day. And it started Matthew thinking. Now, Jesus didn't call Matthew that day, but Matthew heard the message that day, and Matthew thought about the message that day. And we don't know exactly when Jesus called Matthew, but we know that Matthew put it two chapters later in chapter 9. Jesus was walking by, and he saw Matthew in his tax collector's booth, and he said, Matthew, come follow me. Matthew had heard the message that Jesus had taught. He'd thought about it. He'd processed it. And when Jesus said, come follow me, Matthew got up and he left his tax books behind and he left his pile of money. And he never looked back. The same power that spoke to Matthew is the same power that speaks to us today. And the same power that, that spoke to Matthew is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The reason that we're here to celebrate today and that same power is available to change our lives too. Now I don't do what I do for the money. There's an awful lot of ways that I can make more money than I make doing what I'm doing now. But I do this because I know that God has changed my life. And I know that He has the power to make me somebody better than I used to be. And that same power is available for all of us. And so as we stand and sing today, I want you to allow these words to sink into your head. Are you willing to make a commitment to a relationship with Jesus Christ? And not just a relationship that, that makes you feel like you're, you're done and you walk out and act like you never made that decision. But a true relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that you nourish, nourish that you cherish, that you develop. And you let Him change you and give you what you're looking for instead of looking in all the places that leave you feeling empty. Let's stand together as we close.